Good morning and welcome to Food Forum Sansi's webinar on agri role on agri media's role in shaping South Africa's future. This is part of Food Forum Sansi's fifth anniversary celebrations. And what better way to salute Food Forum Sansi than to delve into the role that agri media plays in society? So this is just one of uh, the celebrations that are taking place over the next week and we all look forward to the gala dinner on Wednesday night where we can certainly continue this conversation over a glass or two of South Africa's finest bubbly. So I'm Lindy Boerta, I'm an agricultural journalist and communication specialist and I'm also the chairperson of the Agricultural Rights in South Africa. I'm so excited to have an opportunity to speak to all of our guests this morning. Um, for me, they are celebrities in their own right. I don't really have any celebrity crushes, but I seem to get all, all starry-eyed uh, speaking to to the likes of Leona and Wandile and, and Iva and Mervyn, who we all have with us this morning. So they don't really need an introduction because they have already established themselves as strong and influential voices in uh, the agricultural media space, but I am just going to give a brief introduction about everybody. So firstly, we have Leona Archery, who is the CEO of the Agricultural Development Agency, or uh, more commonly known as AGDO, who is driving inclusivity and sustainability in the agricultural sector. Then we have Fondelia Sichobo, who is the Chief Economist at Anvers, or as I often like to refer to him, as the guy who makes agriculture look cool. Juan Dile is actually an honorary journalist in his own right, um, tweeting, writing, podcasting, and giving insight into agriculture across team networks. Then there's Mervyn Abrams, who is the program coordinator of the Peter Maritzburg Economic Justice and Dignity Group, who is also a very strong voice advocating for food security for all. And of course, Ivor Price, who is the co-founder and chief editor of the Food Forum Zanzi Group, who at this stage, I think we can call a pioneer in the agri-media space and an absolute game changer when it comes to inclusivity and fair, represent fair representation of the agricultural industry. So good morning, everybody. Um, at this stage, I also just want to take the opportunity to congratulate Ivor, you and your co-founded Purvis Lawrence and the rest of the Food Forum Zanzi team for the wonderful work you've been doing over the past five years and everything you've achieved in such a short time. Um, I, I really think Food Forum Zanzi has played a massive role in showcasing a side of agriculture that many of us haven't seen before and um, sadly, mistakenly, perhaps thought wasn't there. But from what I've seen, there really is this vibrant group of young go-getters working towards food security and greater economic inclusivity in South Africa. So, Aba, can you perhaps just start the conversation by explaining to us, why did you start Food from Zanzi in the first place? And what did you believe makes the publication a game changer? Thank you, Lindy. It's great hearing um, these words from you. We've long been an admirer of your work and certainly of all the other people on the screen this morning. It feels surreal to be celebrating five years of Food from Zanzi. When Kubus and I started it in November 2018, it was honestly just going to be a three-month project. We never intended to start a publication. Not everybody believes us when we say that, but it was just before an election and I was presenting a television series traveling across the country, documenting stories of exceptional farmers in that time. Quibus and I had been friends for more than two decades, started out as journalists and newspaper in Cape Town, Die Burger. And over the years, we've had similar career paths as, as, as colleagues and, and best friends and shared stories of the Lambo Vehicleux experience. And it bothered us that just before that election in 2018, um, and, and my experience on the farms um, and the media's portrayal of it, it didn't seem to match. It was just murder and, and farmers putting farm workers in coffins and um, the word boar and farmers being meddled up in, 
in politics and people saying horrible stuff about the people who feed them. And it just um, felt so wrong. And we wanted to start a publication that could um, be less black and white and, and tell these exceptional stories and also link only people to the agricultural value chain. What then happened was the farmers started adopting us. We didn't build food from Zansi for them, in all honesty. We wanted to speak to ordinary South Africans. The farmers then started adopting us. Food from Zansi soon became a bit of a movement. And now actively we co-create what we call the new face of South African agriculture. Many people say in 2023, they no longer believe in the rainbow magic. You can't work at Food from Zansi if you are not prepared to hold on to possibility. And we create that possibility through, through agriculture. We try to be as inclusive as, as possible. We're a tiny team. And I can tell you, it's it's much more than a job. It's a, it's a calling for, I think, most of us. Um, and that is hopefully what contributes to our success. You know, being able to not only tell stories, but to champion change and to champion real people. We see them at our events. They come, they drive for hours to be there. They're real people with real stories. And we love how our journalism and our work often changes their lives. Often we hear when we wrote about somebody, a day or two later, the phone rings and it's a big company, you know, Barmalat saying, hey, we read that. We'd love to support that farmer. And a few months later, we see that farmer being fast-tracked towards commercialization. That is what, what wakes us up in the morning, Lindy. That's, that's absolutely wonderful. And that, I must just say, I think um, what you've managed to do, what many publications haven't managed to do, is that you've made your, your workforce and your journalists more inclusive. And I think that goes a long way in just making sure, because everybody's got a different perspective. And... Um, it's called a spade a spade. White people tend to stick to white people for the most part. And, you know, your network, if your network is, is white, it's white. Um, and perhaps as a, as a black person, your network is inclined to be more black, which, and I think that's where Beautiful Mzanzi has succeeded in that you brought in those journalists who can work within um, a different space and in a different language, even with, with the other languages that, that you that you have on, on Beautiful Mzanzi. So, I find that that the stories that you've been able to showcase are just so much so much broader than what the the traditional media has. But mm. from what I've also just is is uh, sorry, I did. Uh, it's very difficult to draw people into agricultural journalism because just as what it's difficult, you know, there's this perception that it's it's not a sexy industry to work in as a farmer, um, as a journalist. I think if you don't know what agriculture is about, it's just this difficult. So. How have you managed to get such a wonderful, diverse team together that's so invested in agriculture? I must say, um, Quibus was publishing an agricultural magazine um, in a previous lifetime at a previous company we both worked at. And there, um, the thinking was that you can't write about agriculture until you've been in journalism for 20 years. <laughs> we see. Our magic, our secret source is that we knew nothing about agriculture. And as outsiders, we had the privilege of looking from the outside in. And that gave perhaps a bit of a different perspective to, to agriculture. As we continue this journey, then we are now discovering that for a long time, we thought agricultural journalism only happened if certain people did it. We're now discovering journalism in agriculture way beyond what Food from Zansi does, the traditional agricultural publications, you know, from the likes of Daily Maverick to Mail Mary, and Guardian to the Sowetan, great agricultural coverage <laughs> without us ever having, having named it. That being said, inclusivity is important to us and it's even difficult for us. Our office is based in Paul in the Western Cape. The Western Cape is a predominantly candid, um, you know, um, population. So even here we have to make conscious decisions. Who's our audience? Where are they? What do they look like? And we also don't want to be too black, you know, you know. So one of our, um, it's inclusivity goes both ways, you know? <laughs> um, so you get all 
all sorts of shades in, in the food film Zanzi family. But what matters is that we've got a common goal. We see the same picture. We share a vision for South African agriculture and food security. And in the end, that is what makes the difference. We're also very strong. At some point, most of our team were women, a couple of powerhouses in, in, in this family. And I don't ever recall us ever making a decision saying we're now hiring women. Um, in, in all of the cases, they've just been the best. <laughs> Shinda. I find the media in general is, is female, and I think that's also why the demographics are often skewed. Um, can I just perhaps ask a burning question here that a lot of agri-media is, is asking ourselves, um, and having a, been in, mostly in the print industry myself, do farmers still read? Yeah, they read more than ever before. We've had this discussion um, recently at one of our farmers, farmers' days, sort of an in, informal discussion. And as a journalist for more than two decades and somebody who grew up in print, the thing is that they don't read. We don't have a printed magazine. They find us <laughs> through online because they read. Um, and we, um, in, in internet journalism, we can literally track how far they read in stories, how far they come, the depth of their stories. They read a bit differently than, than when I think most of us grew up, you know, it's not something they um, necessarily pick up and they read it from, from the front to the end. They read, they listen, they consume. So Food from Zansi considers itself an omni-channel brand. We have readers who just follow us on Instagram and they call themselves Food from Zansi readers. TikTok, LinkedIn is exploding at the moment, Facebook. They all consider, consider themselves, themselves readers. Reading doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be a piece of paper that's, that's in your hand. In our view, um, they read more than ever. They read um, just a little bit different from what we used to. Fiona, can I get your opinion? What are you, where do you get your agricultural news from? Thanks. Thanks, Lindy. I think like Alva is saying from, from different platforms, but I think that has also changed over time, you know, conventionally you'd get them from your regular publications, you know, your Lanvo via, via Blood, Farmers Weekly, uh, all of the news that flows between us as commodity organizations and partners in agri, uh, weekly news that each one puts out as well. Uh, one delay as well puts out a lot of uh, bulletins and news in the week, so we do get it from there. But I think more and more, uh, definitely, uh, social media is playing a big role in, in where we get our info from. Food Firm Zanzi is definitely top of our list at the moment, Ivor, for where we get info. Uh, and I think, interestingly, you know, you raise the issue about finding the farmers and their nuisance and the real story uh, on uh, the platforms that you are putting them the information out on. So we also get our information from there and able to connect uh, with farmers in that way as well. And I think for me, uh, you know, it's becoming very real. The way in which stories are being told now is real stories of real people on the ground. And uh, I, I really must salute uh, Food from Zanzi for that and for the way in which you depict those stories. So definitely different platforms, Lindy, but social media is something that's quick and easy. Uh, you know, your Facebook, your, your Instagram. And uh, I think, you know, when we say, are people still reading? Definitely. But we are definitely doing it differently because I think, you know, you have quite a hurried and pressured kind of timeline that you try and fit everything in, in uh, at the moment. And so these kind of platforms give us the ability, online publications, to actually connect very quickly uh, with what's happening in the agri-space um, than we used to in the past. Mervyn, what about you? Has the, has the way in which you've consumed media changed over the years? So, and so here. Yeah, so yeah so i would agree with the previous speakers i mean i think we 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 read as we did before in fact i i find that i perhaps read a little more i mean uh particularly electronics or online uh online is useful so if you're sitting i often have time free sitting at the school waiting to pick up kids uh, uh at the track uh um so that kind of 10 minutes, 15 minutes can, that's when I also consume 
a lot of, of, of information and particularly online information because the cell phone is handy, I've got my computer out, etc. Of course, I still like the feel of paper. I grew up in that world, paper. When I read a book, it must be a real book, not an e-book. I, I need to feel the paper. But, but, but as I say, a lot of online stories, and, and what I find particularly useful from what Food for Mazanzi is doing, and which I consume a lot, is the real life stories of different individual persons. And, um, and also the kind of more positive stories. Uh, uh, in South Africa at the moment, we, we, are, we have lots and lots of negative stories. Uh, I enter the, the food debate from a consumer angle around affordability of food, uh, accessibility of food, but I am also aware of the, of the value chain. And then so when I read stories of young women entering into agriculture, when I read stories of young men entering into agriculture or, or, or home gardens being networked, that for me is a sign of hope for where the future goes. And, and so I really would like to congratulate Food for Mzansi for particularly some of those articles, which, of course, I find extremely useful. Yes, I'll, I'll definitely echo those views. Thank you, Mervyn. One day there, I'm not going to ask you the same question because at the rate at which you put information out, um, I can see that you do a lot of reading and I'm sure that includes a lot of lot of reports um, and I know you also have, have access to a lot of high level stuff. But what I want to know from you is whether you think that the agricultural media has any influence on policy decisions or what kind of impact can agricultural media actually make in the lives of farmers? Yeah, um, uh, but thanks, uh, Lindy. I, I think the first, uh, just to join uh, the colleagues on uh, uh, congratulating Ivor Kubas and the, and the entire team at Food for Mzansi. I think the work that you, you've been able to do over the past five years has been enormous. I mean, your presence is felt. Uh, so you, you just have to, to keep at that. You've set the bar quite high. So there, there's a tough job to, you know, decades ahead to, to keep at it on that. And I, and I, I think, I mean, I would uh, I agree in, in both the points that have been made uh, by Leona and, and Marvin, because, I mean, you, you have a couple of things uh, firstly here. The first, on the question of whether policymakers uh, do have access to information in a way that is packaged uh, by food from Zanzi, and where do they get their information from? And I do think that we have to have appreciation that, I mean, most of these people, Ioana knows she is, uh, was one of the senior officials in, in, in the Department of, of Land Affairs. The fact that they spend a lot of their time in the meetings, moving from one high level meeting to another, engaging the communities, um, and a lot more work that they need to read that is related um, to, to the task that they have uh, at hand. So in between that, which is where the sweet spot at which um, uh, and the colleagues have been able to do is to try to take the stories, firstly, make them succinct enough and write them in a careful way of language, not to say you are dumbing down things, but apply the simplicity in your writing that is necessary for people to quickly grasp that. Because to try to be complex unnecessarily, I, I mean, it makes your communication ineffective. Because first of all, why are you communicating? You're communicating to get your point uh, across. It, the simplest possible way at which you can say this in a succinct way, appreciating the time constraint of your of your readers and respecting their, their time. And I think that's what the colleagues are able to do that. And secondly, I mean, the, the political uh, leadership and, and, and the people in policy, they have their cell phone on hand and, and they, they pretty much follow a lot about what's happening. And I can say, I mean, I'm not saying this to be nice to, to guys at Food Forms Answer because I'm on their platform. I know from WhatsApps of the of the of the leadership that there's all you probably have a much more circulation on the stories that gets to be shared to say, hey, have you seen X Y Z happening in Bizana in the Eastern Cape? Have you seen X Y Z in Richmond in KZN or in Modimoli in Limpopo? Have you seen this and this happening? So that on the ground also providing narrative is important, and I would say their work is not only ending at that policymaker stuff because you have to also appreciate the fact that. Most people that are in economics or analysts, 
They are looking at numbers to try to make sense of the world. The numbers tell them trends and things that are happening, but you also have to understand then the narratives that are behind those numbers. So seeing what all of the online fast moving um, uh, uh, media provides about what are the events happening, even Marvin telling about the stories of the people that are struggling in certain areas, then that begins to bring texture in the numbers that we would be looking at to say what exactly is drive. So all in all, that is a long winded way of saying um, the work that Ivo and the colleagues are doing um, is quite uh, available. And I do think that it reaches at the right level. As to whether then it moves the dial on policy or not, I mean, it certainly does because at the end of the day, the stories that you carry, they change the narrative and they influence the way of thinking of people. It may not be visibly direct that the policy moves in your direction, but one way or another, you have enhanced the thinking or understanding of the problem. Then the policymakers make their decision upon all of those information that they've been consuming for a period. Thanks. Thanks, Wandile. Liana, as uh, Wandile pointed out, you were previously uh, in the gov in government uh, as the uh, Deputy Director General of the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform. So did you see firsthand um, that agri-media has any influence on policy decisions? Most definitely. Um, I think that, uh, like Wandile is saying, um, in the space when you are developing policy, um, it's also important for you to understand what thinking of people outside is. And um, I think agri-media and media in general does play a very important role or shapes without you know directly doing that like Wandile is saying, but it does shape your thinking. It, you know, if I look at, at uh, the media at the moment and uh, where it was probably five years ago um, when there was a lot of talk around expropriation without compensation, and, and the impact that that was having, you know, and almost a frenzy that was happening in the space uh, and what what was feeding into that. And the importance of uh, being able to extract the information that is important in your policymaking processes. And uh, often enough, you're not going to have the ability to reach everyone, uh, you know, when you're a policymaker to understand their thinking. But what you get out of the media, and that's why I think the importance of uh, you know, the accountability of how matters are reported or depicted is also very important. Um, and and so if you look at that time, and I think Iva touched on that as well, there was so much of negativity around what was happening in the farming sector. And that could have gone away in actually, you know, pushing us into developing policies or programs that really didn't uh, drive us in the inclusivity that we wanted to see in agriculture, because it could have polarized us. And what we needed to do is take from what was happening in the country and build that in uh, so that you still get out policy, positive policies, uh, you know, that make the right impact. If I look at what's happening, you know, over the years since then and and um, from 2018, Iva, it so happened that all of this coincided. And ANDA also, by the way, was established in the same year. Uh, but we were all wanting to find good solutions, all right, for what was happening. And and media had a very important role to play in helping some of those good solutions to emerge. And so I think, you know, uh, Lindy, the, the role that um, agri-media does play is help to build that social capital part that does influence because policy is supposed to influence how people act on the ground, right? And what happens in your country. And I think media has a very big role to play in that building social capital and the positive stories that come out uh, beginning to showcase those things that government and its officials and the policymakers won't directly get to. Uh, but when you see it, you begin to realize, listen, there's a lot more good happening underground that we are not seeing or behind the scenes that we are not seeing. And how do we use that as well in the crafting of the policies that we are making for the country? So, Liana, do you think there are particular stories that need to be highlighted or particular issues that the agri-media needs to needs to focus on more in order to grow the agricultural industry in a positive way going forward? 100%, Lindy. I think one of the big things that we are all driving, and, and Wandile is aware of that, is when we drive the agricultural um, agriculture and agro-processing master plan, right, it is hinged on us being able to build solid partnerships uh, in order to drive inclusivity in the agri-sector. 
uh, I mean, it is a space that has a lot of history around it, like we've spoken about. So I think that what the what Agri Media could be doing and and is doing well, you know, in the last few years, is actually highlighting how the partnership models are beginning to emerge and make a difference in the sector. You know, in the past, there was always this rhetoric that, uh, you know, if you did equity schemes, they were going to fail because uh, a white commercial farmer didn't really want to partner with a new entrant in agriculture. And when you actually look at the stories that are coming out, you see that that is not necessarily 100% the case, right? And so I think if we can begin to highlight where this is actually working, you know, where are these partnerships model making a difference for new entrants coming into agriculture across the value chain, uh, then you're going to make other people want to do the same. And I think from what Iba is saying, you know, and I, and we've seen it in Agda as well, where you see a good and a good practice model and you put it out there and you give it uh, the airtime that it requires, then others see it and say, okay, you know, this is probably something that we could be doing. And I think the more we begin to do that, then focus only on the negative, the more we build confidence that we can actually build strong partnerships and that everybody in the agri sector does want to see growth in the sector and does want to see things change for the better. Um, and so for me, I think that the partnership model is one, but also to show what new opportunities exist. Uh, you know, agriculture and the way you do agriculture has been changing. Uh, you know, the food systems in our country have been changing. And what better place to highlight that than through agri-media? And we've seen uh, with the interest of young people as well, and I think uh, Food Farm Zanzi does a very good job of highlighting also what young people are doing in the space. And not just focusing in on what the bigger commercial persons are doing, but what can be done at your small and medium enterprise level. So you begin to actually drive a new passion for the sector uh, and get more people involved because we keep saying, right, Agri is the one space that can create jobs for our country. Uh, and that's where we need to get entrepreneurs involved in. And the more you say what is possible, I believe more people begin to try and get into the space. And I think those are the opportunities that exist for us in the media. At this Mervyn, you've been quite, quite vocal also in terms of highlighting food security issues. And I, I love the work that you've been doing in that. Every time I see an article that quotes you, um, you you have a knack for giving the right numbers and really sketching a good picture um, of what is happening on a ground level. But do you think there are things that the agricultural media needs to highlight or focus more on um, in order to bring positive change? Yeah, so, so I mean, I think uh, uh, the agricultural media space is doing a good job. I mean, Food from Zanz is doing a good job. Um, one of the areas I do think uh, that we, and this is not just the media, the media, I see the media as a public space, that uh, public square that allows for debate, uh, uh, highlighting stories, providing good, good uh, role models, uh, etc. But I think the one area that we can do more of is to think of the agri-space or agriculture as a continuum. I, Whenever I read articles, there is always the idea that the local small-scale farmer has to become uh, an industrial commercial farmer. Uh, it's important, of course, that everyone needs to earn money in the process, uh, but not everyone needs to be in the model of the commercial farmer. So can we begin to take, can we see agriculture as a continuum, starting from perhaps community level uh, agriculture, networked family gardens around a food hub in a local community, um, you know, bringing other alternative ideas and models of being a farmer to the fore because not everyone will be able to fit into the commercial uh, uh, sector. And in any case, uh, uh, the commercial sector on its own will not be able to provide food security. We also need the small farmers in communities close to where the food is grown, close to the plate, uh, shorter value chains, uh, et cetera. So, I mean, those are areas I think where more stories can emerge. 
Thanks, Mervyn. Yes, that you make a very good point. And I think there's, there's, there are so many levels. And, and uh, one dealer that now recently wrote in his book also about just how how diverse the agricultural sector is in South Africa. And I think there's, there's room for everybody to play in a certain section, especially when it comes to ensuring food security. Ivo, can you tell me, I mean, is there, are there specific areas where, where you want to move the publication into to have a better, to have a, uh, a greater and a continuous impact mm -hmm. on food security and sustainability? I think um, the colleagues touched on um, a lot of it, and I think Mervyn beautifully described how not everybody needs to be a large-scale commercial farmer. COVID-19 also brought that realization to, to many, many South Africans, you know, that while we are food secure at a national level, we certainly now know um, that people are, are struggling um, at, at a local level and, and you know, there are beautiful stories and, and, and difficulties to be documented in, in that space. One of the other opportunities that Food for Mzansi actively embraces, and we believe all agricultural media has got a role to play there, is the potential to impact on the sector's growth. Um, we believe that the sector's where agricultural media's most um, substantial impact um, in playing the sector lies in its ability to educate and, and connect. By far, among the most popular pieces of content that we put out are what we have begun calling the how-to articles. You know, people are desperate for advice. The, the university of, of the streets accepts the university of the internet, where we use our power and our influence and our access to people to get the knowledge, to, as one dealer said, simplify that information so that the, the masses can understand it, you know, you know, from an academic journal to a language that 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 new era farmers can 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 understand. And we believe that providing comprehensive coverage, facilitating access to markets, um, we try to connect as many people as we can. I did this um, 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 tremendous work in in, in, in that space and has become a go-to to many people. Um, innovation, by showing them possibilities in innovation, um, by introducing them to opportunities in agricultural technologies, you know, all these new things that are out there that they don't necessarily know of. Um, we see our role as educating and, and, and connecting them, finding, helping them find opportunities, being the person in the room that says, Hey, I just heard you speaking about that. Do you know person X in Northwest or in the free state? Have you met or heard about this farmer in a rural part of KwaZulu Natal that's doing exactly, exactly, exactly that? The other day I got a call from the cannabis belt in, in, in the Eastern Cape. There was some big development there. And um, I was incredibly moved that they wanted to share their story first with us and then also to help them find access to, to information and, and, and education to, to level up their, their, their game. So we definitely see our role in um, empowering farmers and also promoting sustainable practices. Um, lastly, um, we see an increasing role in helping new era farmers or the, these new faces of South African agriculture um, be kinder to the environment embracing conservation agriculture practices and taking climate change seriously. We get on farms um, and we often see disaster. That disaster has got a name, it's climate change. And um, if you're lucky, we've got great agricultural media out there. If you read one of the legacy publications, chances are you're more informed. You know, it's got a bit of a more of a scientific, scientific approach, but these farmers we represent are left vulnerable. They need access to information and education to help them now um, with probably one of the biggest problems um, facing us um, um, in, our, in our lifetime. So yeah, to educate, to connect, that's what we would love to continue doing for, for decades to come. Now, I agree with you about, about the how-to articles because I think, um, you know, in my experience, even when, when I'm approaching a specific subject, there could be a lot of research papers written about something, but it takes me sometimes a full day just to 
just to interpret the, the the research because it's it's written in such a scientific manner and it's important to have um, to be able to translate that information into a way that's that's understandable. Um, you know, and that was also may have mentioned earlier on about um, what Dili was saying about you know how you need to not necessarily dumb it down, but you need to put it in a way that it that it's easy to grasp. And I was I was always told. Um, if you can't dumb it down, it means you don't actually understand it well enough in order to explain it. Um, and, and sometimes us as journalists really need to, um, you know, ask researchers to explain a thing over and over and ask them. Can't so far when dealing with engineers to ask them to draw me pictures because I don't understand something. Because if we don't understand it, how on earth are the farmers supposed to understand it? So we, we really do have a duty to to get that information to them. So, one day you've had a lot of experience, um, and you've written so much about the agricultural sector, um, and you know you've travelled the world over and and seen so much. I mean, and even in 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 your book that you've written about um, the the dichotomy of the industry, what in your experience um, and in your opinion do you think South African farmers need most from the agricultural media at this stage in order to succeed? Yeah, I, I, th I think before I answer that, uh, L L Lindy, uh, th there's a question that I want to ask uh, Ivo. Uh, Ivo, what, what's, what's usually the, the approach to writing, uh, to think about stories and the level of sympathy that your journalists uh, have to have uh, when they are dealing uh, with all of the stories? Because, I mean, I do think that we have to paint uh, a, a positive story about this. Uh, yes, storytellers rule the world. But those things that shouldn't ignore some of the difficulties that are there and the difficult subjects um, in, in our society. Because, I mean, if you bury the problem, it only becomes larger down the line. But it's only about how sympathetic and how your approach will be on narrating that problem and not exploit the problem but tell it in a way that is sympathetic with a certain level of understanding. But I want to, 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 to hear from Ivo, the approach to writing, especially when they bring in the young journalists that are outside the sector. And then, Lindy, I'll, I'll, come, I'll, I'll answer the question about what are some of the areas that I think are for, for farmers uh, will be useful for the media to perhaps maybe elevate um, their the, the work in. That's a great and a difficult question, Wandile. So in... What, what we find, and I found this in the previous lifetime too, um, that when journalists typically leave graduate school, um, they enter the workplace, um, my species think we know it all, you know. Um, we've got the power of the pen, of the microphone, of, of the keyboard, and, you know, we think we know it all. And when new people enter the Food Forms Zanzi family, the first thing we have to activate, because it's inside all of us, is empathy for, for the audience. I mean, we love and breathe for the Food Forms and the audience. We are responsible for, for their futures, and, um, and we've got access and, and power that we can use to create, um, to create beautiful change if we use it responsibility. So um, sympathy, empathy, kindness, understanding their challenges, um, understanding where they live, how they live. Um, um, you know, most of our farmers don't have pretty lives. Um, yeah, they're great on social media and you see the beautifully created videos and, and social media images. But once you get on those farms, you see, just yesterday, um, one of the stories that are yet to be published, there's no electricity. This farmer um, doesn't know it yet. <laughs> But she's winning a big award next next week. Um, there's no electricity there. Um, they don't know where they're going to get the money to 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 feed cattle. Others. So understanding their their situations, and then approaching the story um, from from that angle, and then the big responsibility to actively challenge the media media's portrayal um, of 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 farmers, and I think of black farmers, of women farmers, of white farmers, as Leona said. We actually to go above and beyond forming forming these partnerships, you know, um, um, that helps us and influences 
and shapes how we do our agricultural journalism. Yeah, yeah. No, then uh, th thanks, Ivo, for that. Because let me then to, to your question. I mean, what what I think about it to say what do folks probably want to 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 read about? I think it was important th those approach that Ivo is talking about uh, on how to narrate the story. Because my sense is that because farmers are in all of these remote areas doing their own things in their areas, it's always helpful to, to sort of, uh, for them to understand what are farmers at KZ and if I'm in Northwest actually working on and what are some of those uh, 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 stories with a human touch beyond the numbers of looking at prices, production levels and all of those things, but rather some of the, the human uh, touch stories. That, that, that for me is, is always something that I think folks are always looking forward uh, to know. But I think, as you were saying, I mean, uh, the, the pieces that are solution-oriented, uh, regardless of the problem is, if there was an area where there's a problem with the poultry farmer and then somebody else has come up with a solution to resolve whatever the problem may, may be, sharing all of those things, because then that's what leads to creativity and people finding things valuable. Because people are looking for solution and they are looking for some level of inspiration so that they can continue doing what they are doing. So I think as long as you are solution oriented and then you have the positive stories and even the stories then that are illustrating the, the fundamental problems that are there in South African society, I think that is important. What I would think I will going forward, you have to do and, and the community at Food for Mzanzi is actually that nice plan to say, how do you talk to people like Freddie Mayer of, of BFAP and Tracy Davids, Tinashe Kapuyas of this world and say, okay, you sitting there, Marshall, you're having all of this heavy data. How do we bring you into conversation? So you begin breaking down all of those things and then bring the narrative approach that Food for Mzanzi have and give the guys really those lengthy um, uh, uh, pieces that have that solution oriented, but digested um, in, a, in a useful way. And I would say, that, I mean, you would add that as you are already doing, because I find that things that are in videos and the other things, Folks consume those things and they are distributing them on uh, on all kinds of WhatsApps and the other social medias. And I do think that Food for Mzanz is staying alive as you're already doing within that space is something that is also uh, valuable. So I would say the topics per se, Lindy, will differ about what guys wants to hear about. But as long as it's a solution-oriented approach to various problems that the sector faces, as well as um, th those stories that have a little bit of an upliftment. Because, I mean, to close, I mean, as Leona was saying, at the end of the day, I mean, farmers are people that are resilient and living in that space of hope. And you have to be cognizant of those things. Then when you say, how are you picturing and putting all of these stories while at the same time offering people value in that story, not only just the hope because they're spending time on that. So they have to learn and, and go out uh, with something that is useful. But I think you've been able to, to do that is just to intensify that. Um, as as you go forward with that approach in your in your writing, because I think that's what actually makes you distinct. I mean, I mean, I read a lot of things from early morning, so I could see the style and the and the approach in various medias, which is why I was asking what why you you, you add it to your your pieces the way you do. Thanks. Can I just add that, Lindy? One that is a great example for for um, not just young journalists, but for journalists everywhere. Um, one day, the way you pivot. Um, an industry colleague recently referred to the Friends episode where they like pivot, pivot, pivot and moving the couch. And you did it. Um, you pivoted. First it was Twitter um, and um, Instagram and, and now you pivoted so quickly to video. I mean, it takes us in journalism a lot longer to, to make that kind of bold move, moves, but you do it so effortlessly. So we learn a lot from you too. So, Wandili and Ivy, you now both touching on the next uh, question I want to get to. Um, so, Ivy, while I've got you on the screen, let me let me pose the question to you first. You have attended a lot of media conferences around the world over the past few months, um, different times. I said that the recent one was in was in Thailand, I think. Um, so, what are, what kind of developments are you seeing in media um, that you're excited about and that could bring information? closer to people and in a more uh, user-friendly and sustained way. Mm. Yeah, it's it's incredible that Food for Mzansi now has access to all these platforms and get invited to 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 share. I mean, people read Food for Mzansi across the continent, not even knowing Mzansi means South Africa. Um, we were 
um, in Nigeria earlier this year, receiving an award. In fact, Quibus is at the Nigerian conference again um, next week. But it's important for us as a digital first news brand to stay on top of the latest trends and research. I mean, it changes so fast. Just three months ago, Twitter was still the in thing. Now Twitter is bad news and people are leaving, leaving Twitter. So it's not just social media. It's also the latest technologies and media trends. It's the insights into how people read, into, into how they consume um, news and, 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 and content and the latest demands from, from, from newer generations, trends in podcasting. The one thing that um, excites me is um, um, the strategies around audience and, and engagement. Um, you know, you build the ship, um, but how do you service service the audience? Um, and in Food Food from Zanzi's case, how do you sustain the movement? Um, how do you serve the audience better by listening to the questions they they asking you, giving them the answers, and then also um, exploring new technologies. Um, you know, we don't actively do that do that yet, but I'm excited about things like. Just yesterday, I had a fascinating meeting about block, blockchain technologies in, in agriculture. How do we fish the latest information and, and who do we connect with um, to bring those kind of solutions to, to our audience um, while building user-friendly um, platforms? That is, that is what excites me. And obviously, um, as a business owner, build, building a sustainable model, um, we've seen a dramatic shift in the global and South African media space in in the last five years, especially post COVID nineteen. I, I come from print. Melvin mentioned that he still loves print. I was a newspaper delivery boy <laughs> at high school. I, I come from gen um, from from newspapers, but um, it's shifting, accelerating. I find my mother, who's close to seventy, now reading news network print with a Hana app. So staying abreast with with um, people's changing dynamics and, and demands and technologies. One really, as, as I correctly pointed out, can you really hold the cutting edge of, of information dissemination? So can I hear from you, what, do you uh, what, are the, what are the future technologies or ways in which um, news is disseminated that are exciting you? I mean, we, we've seen... Um, Things like data journalism that's that's coming into play with, like Ava mentioned, you bring in all, all this information and all these numbers and being able to make sense of it and perhaps the shift away from Twitter maybe towards it. TikTok is the next big thing. Where, where do you see, you know, ag agri media or, um, or, the, or the space changing? Oh, Lindy, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, I, I, I think... Uh, I mean, so the, the the challenge that you have um, is this: you you, you are a, as a media house, you you sort of a, a condo and often also sound uh, scanning one uh, some of the events that are happening, digesting them, and then have a product, and then hoping then that somebody will consume that product and will take it and, and run with it on that. Then that means uh, paying attention at how people are spending more of their time um, and, and what really do they grasp because you have also a generational shift, which is a problem for the media at this moment. The older generation that consumed information in a certain way is now at a level where they are slowing down in their work and the young people are consuming the information in a separate, in a different way. And they are the ones that are taking off. When you go to food from Zanti conferences for young farmers, you get a sense of who is there. And I think what helps for food from Zanti and what will keep them, because you, you actually don't even need either to be thinking a lot about what are the new ways at which people will um, consume the information. Because the journalists and writers at food from Zanti are not sitting on their side and looking at the audience. They are part and parcel of the community that they, they are in. Duncan knows who farmer that I, I is talking to or the young people in corporates that he's friends with, where are they getting their information from? So you best seated to actually be able to serve them that particular information. And some of the ways at which even 
will disseminate uh, uh, information on where either I'm putting it on trend or on X or even in you know, some of those things, they even come by chance whereby you are thinking, okay, if I were to write this thing down, it's going to take me three minutes, but I could record it in 30 seconds without much texture and then put it out there because it's the message that I want um, to put in. And I think those things whereby then you use a multimedia approach is the one that will always be useful and not only lean on one. And Food Bombs answer, you do this, you have LinkedIn where you have a really engaged audience that goes there because people go on LinkedIn almost like working and saying, this is a 30 minutes, I'll jump in there and actually see what are some of the things that I will focus in. And then you also have then those that are sitting down in a queue somewhere and they are scrolling through and saying, okay, on X, what are some of the posts that are there that people are saying as a high paced news? But the other audience is sitting somewhere quiet and they want to watch stuff. So I would almost say for every piece that Food from Zanzi have, if you could have a succinct way of saying, how do we summarize this in a few sentences and put it up and linked it on Twitter? At the same time, if your writer can have to record a short video that summarizes what they say, then I think that is something that, that can work and not only be dominant in one um, a part of the, of the, of the media. And the other thing that is also good for you guys at Food from Zanzi is also the fact that you are a small to medium sized company, which then you are not the New York Times to buy before you change anything. There's all of the compliance and the approach and this long editorial process that is involved. So you are able to pivot and change uh, and actually capitalize on a number of avenues on that. And I think that's useful. And I don't know uh, if Leona, is, is that the way that you see, because I'm sure when you're reading your, 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 your information, it depends where you're sitting. Uh, and how much time it's there. And I'm not sure if that's the approach at which you, you would also consume as well as the actor uh, partners. Is that how they would see it? No, I think absolutely, Wandile. I think, um, and I think Mervyn said it earlier as well, it just depends where you are in the course of your day, right? So uh, if you, in the mornings, you like to read a lot of stuff before you prep for the day and, and you have a little bit more time. But when you're in between meetings and you're waiting on things, it's, what can I get to quickly? What information, you know, just in five minutes I've, I've been able to absorb. So I think using, you know, like you're saying, uh, a different or, or multimedia uh, sort of opportunities or channels would be really excellent. Um, I, I think the one thing, Iva, and, and you touched on that, that, uh, you know, where would you guys focus on? Um, and I think you're covering it in terms of the issue around education and staying connected. And I think that even as you use that, you try to educate, your podcasts are excellent, uh, you know, and it's getting information to people very quickly. Uh, I think it's also about, uh, like you're saying, pivoting on what is the information you want to get across. I was thinking, Wandile, like, you know, when, when crisis hits the agri sector, you know, like foot and mouth, for example, you need information to go out quickly. You need it to reach some of those areas which not would not conventionally get that information very quickly. So like you're saying, you have to be adept, you have to be quick to respond and different uh, platforms are going to help you to do that. So I think it's just beginning to look at what matches um, the audience that you are trying to target at that moment in time and which strategy you want to follow to actually get uh, get them that information as quickly yes. as possible. Yes. Yeah. I, so, I, think then, I think then, Leona, on that, if that it's almost uh, what I, I would put uh, to, 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 to Ivo and the colleagues, what you see for perhaps maybe the, the, the Wall Street Journal and the other colleagues do, whereby on a Saturday, they would have a long Saturday read, whereby you do fast-paced stories during the week, appreciating that the time is limited. Then Marvin is sitting back on a Sunday afternoon after church um, mm -hmm. and the Sunday dinner at, at lunch, and then you can have a bit of a long digestive piece of material that you say, okay, this is something that perhaps one should, 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 should think about. And and just before Lindy uh, comes in at Ivo, to you, Marvin, uh, I, I, would, I would ask also, I mean, a, a question on that to say, looking at farmers, a uh, food from Zanzi approach, always looking to, towards perhaps maybe not always, mostly looking on a farmer's side from a production side. What are the aspects that you think perhaps those people that are the producers are perhaps not appreciating more um, uh, about the consumer. And I say this because you know this, Marvin, there are people that maybe would see you 
as perhaps maybe sitting on an activist side of the food industry and not appreciating that you perhaps make certain points more firmly because you are sympathetic and you are closer so, to certain pains of society that are there that they don't have um, uh, access to. Similarly, they would view you in that way because they think that you are not perhaps as sympathetic to them and the cost and the pain that is in there. And I think that the friction that usually lies in there, it has a lot to do uh, with an information asymmetry. So what are some of the things that perhaps you would like Food from Zanzi to really shine a light on so that the farmers that largely read for Food from Zanzi, they have a certain understanding of where you're coming from with some of the statements and the data that you are in. You can unmute, Mave. Yes, so thank you. Yes, Wandile. I mean, you're absolutely correct. I, 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 I do see myself as an activist. <laughs> I don't think there is anything wrong with being an activist. In fact, uh, without activists, the world, this current paradigm just continues. Uh, nothing will really shift and change. Um, so you're absolutely correct. Our entry point, of course, is that of food affordability and therefore from a consumer point of view. However, we also speak to farmers, and I think one area that is often unexplored is the dialogue between the consumer and the farmer. Now, whenever we have brought these two groups together, a better understanding takes place. So farmers can explain their challenges. Farmers, by and large, are price takers. Farmers, by and large, are 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 not the cause or not always the cause of price increases. Uh, uh, um, and they also have challenges in terms of input cost, electricity, et cetera. The section that is often missed out are of course the value chain in terms of manufacturing and production. Uh, uh, so the consumer says, well, the farmer, <laughs> uh, and then the farmer says, but the consumer doesn't understand. And, and so that, that in-between sector often is missed out. And it seems to us that in that sector, much change needs to happen. Uh, if not change, at least a bit of a more investigative light needs to be shined there in order to see where the, these increases in food prices are coming from and whether those increases are in fact justified or not. It might very well be justified, so then explain it to the consumer, or if it is not justified, then ask questions as to as to why not. So, so the dialogue between consumer and the rest of the food value chain is absolutely critical. Uh, uh, um, if the consumer is to understand, and that's where education of course, plays an important role and where the media is that facilitator of a public square where 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 the discussion is happening. So I, I really think that 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 consumers will have great sympathy for 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 farmers and the challenges that farmers face. Uh, but it also then raises the question of what happens between the farm gate and then of course the retail store. And and that often is an untold story. No, absolutely, Marvin, uh, in a sense that that area needs to, to to get a bit of a shine of light. But I can assure you, Marvin, having been someone that participate in that space, that there aren't bad people happening there. But perhaps the one thing that needs to be done is shining light on price formation. And I think this is something that I vote. There's a, a friend of ours called um, Marlene Lowe, who's an economist at APSA. He did a PhD work about the price transmission, about how all of these systems go. And Johan Kirsten was the supervisor in some of the work at Freddie Mayer. We certainly have to, 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 to do some of those information um, and pieces of saying how prices uh, actually get to be where we are, which interestingly is a new book I'm working on about prices, but I won't say much about um, that, that particular work. But I do think that this is something um, that, that is important. I, I understand that we've been going for nearly um, a, an hour and we're probably drawing to a close mm. within the next five minutes or so. And I will we will come back uh, to, 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 to Lindy to, to ask a final question so that within the next five minutes um, that we have, we are able to summarize um, a, 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 this uh, fairly well. And Lindy, I appreciate you allowing me a flexibility to be able to 
really uh, ask some of these key questions uh, from Marvin about how he perceives um, the farming sector from where he's sitting. But in the five minutes that is left, I won't steal your, your mic and expropriate it without compensation. I will leave it to you to quickly sum up uh, for us with your last points on that. Thanks, Lady, for, for allowing the privilege. Thanks, thanks, Wanti. It's always good to get good to get uh, your your insights as well, and and your opinion this is so valued because I feel even though you're an you're an economist, you like I said earlier, you, you're our honorary agricultural journalist. Um, so if I could just get everybody's last thoughts in terms of um, uh, what you would like to see in the agricultural media going forward. If it's um, if it's a specific format you want to see, or um, if this is uh, or perhaps a success story that you want to that you'd like to have celebrated. If we can just end off with everybody's thoughts, please. Uh, Wandita, we can start with you. I think I think for me, uh, the the quick one would like uh, to to you to see um, is is of course I mean uh, the narration of the uh, events and the progress that the same in South Africa is making. I usually repeat uh, the same thing I was telling uh, Leona and the colleagues at the AGM Academy, that we underestimate the progress that the African agricultural sector has made. Uh, we are a sector that has more than doubled in value and volume terms since 1994. And we are in a space now where we actually have jobs that are just under a million are people working in primary agriculture, which is a number we haven't seen since the very early 90s. So there is some that's happened. And if you look at these jobs in the current wages, these are better wages and the better working conditions more broadly in the sector. So these are some of the aspects that needs to be told. And further, to shine a light on areas of opportunities, but also to bring necessary urgency to our policymakers, politicians, and the municipalities that are failing the agricultural sector in SOEs that are delivering to is expected of them to support the growth of the sector. I think it would be useful if perhaps we can uh, stress those things. But I do think the last point, last point we need to, 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 to emphasize is when we're discussing the issues around poverty, people tend to say, okay, uh, you know, many people are happy because um, prices are rising uh, or things being sold outside. The, income, the poverty issue in South Africa is more an income poverty problem where you have households that literally have no income. Even if you can take a bag of meal and drop the price from 20 rand as an example to 10 rand, it by 50%. But if there is no money, there is no money that will remain um, a, a, a challenge. We have then to say, how do we uh, uh, counter those? And those things are usually not just an agricultural problem, but rather a broader societal problem. So mirroring agriculture in broader picture of South African societal problems is something that is useful. Thank you so much and all the best to their friends at uh, Food from Zanzi. I look forward to attending the 50th birthday of Food from Zanzi 50 in the next uh, five decades to come. Uh, thank you, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Liara, can I perhaps rephrase the question for you? Uh, what is well, what is the one thing that you wish every agricultural journalist or perhaps mainstream media journalist in South Africa knew? Yeah, I think that, you know, we've been speaking quite a bit around this um, during this morning. And I think it's really been uh, a really exciting conversation. I think for me, it's about um, that empathy that Iva spoke about and understanding what you are reporting on, right? Because agriculture has a particular nuance about it. And I think you have to be able to connect with what you are reporting on uh, so that and understand that whatever you report is having a significant influence on several others who are reading what you are reporting. Uh, and so for me, it's about just making sure that the way in which you report, and I think Wandile spoke about it, it's, it's not, uh, you know, everything doesn't have to be, it's all doom and gloom kind of thing, but really connecting with the story and understanding that it actually can influence what happens in the space around you. And I think for me that that would be critical. And if I can just add, Lindy, you know, to what Wandile was speaking about to say, you know, as we focus and as we build, there's there's a lot of work um, that the media could be doing in bringing to the fore the issues that are critical for success in agri and, and what is missing in it, you know, the regulatory side and and the lobbying kind of approach and getting conversation going uh, in South African agriculture 
so that even policymakers can understand that, you know, these are the significant areas that we really do need to focus on if we want inclusive growth in the agri sector going forward. And yeah, and since it's my last comment, also want to wish uh, the Food Farm Zanzi team really, it's an excellent job you guys have been doing. I don't know if I'll be there at that 50th anniversary, but I'm sure you're definitely going to get there. But it's great to have this conversation with you all this morning. Thanks, Lindy. Thank you, Liana, and thank you also for all your insights and and the positivity that you bring in your in the in the job that you do as uh, at at Agda, and also for all your comments this morning. I know we'll all take it to heart, and it's definitely something that we will work on going forward because it's it's something that we all believe in. We all believe in the success of the agriculture, and we certainly want to tell the good stories. Both if I can get a last comment from you, uh, Liana mentioned an incredibly important word, lobby. Uh, I think we sometimes underestimate the the role that the media can play in lobbying for for better uh, uh, policies and and and, and better environments. What is what what is the particular issue that you want to see highlighted uh, in the year going forward to ensure better food security and sustainable food production systems? So of course the the issue I mean uh, uh, access to sufficient and nutritious food. Uh, is majorly impacted by inflation. So, so we would like, from a, a, a lobbying point of view, that that becomes uh, an issue that is carried in the media. I know that Food to Mazanzi does. Uh, generally, in the media, the issue around food price inflation is a dominant issue. Uh, I would say that that should continue. Uh, but it should be continued in a manner that helps us to understand uh, exactly where these inflation repressions are coming from. So there needs to be not only a lobbying, but also an educative uh, a role that we can really understand that. And, 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 and so, because at the end of the day, the agriculture, the purpose of agriculture is really to put food on the table and it's to put not just food, but nutritious food on the table. And it's to ensure that there is sufficient to go around for everyone. So so we shouldn't lose that. Uh, and then at the end of the day, regulation, policy are driven also by political issues. And, and I keep on coming back to the role of the media as facilitating that public square in a democracy, connecting people in conversation. And it is that connecting people in conversation, which of course has political import and then drives politicians to focus on some aspect of policy or, or focus on some particular challenge. So, so I would I would encourage Food for Mazanzi to continue doing that uh, and continue to highlight the issue of food price inflation and the impact it has on food security uh, at household level in South Africa, because if we don't get that right, then really from a social point of view, from a security point of view, from an economic point of view, the country cannot be a success. Thank you, Marvin. That's a very, very important point. And on that note, I do we do need to conclude our discussion this morning. But if I can just, if I... If I look at all the comments that we've received this morning, I think it's it's clear that Food from Zanzi is on the right path. I think there's uh, been a lot of progress made in terms of showcasing the side of agriculture that wasn't shown before, and that we now have the opportunity to see all of these success stories, to see the real perseverance of the farmers, and also the challenges that they face and being able to highlight it. And of course, there's so many success stories that come out of that, just where somebody's plight and story was told, um, and they've been able to uh, gain a partnership or a mentorship or some kind of uh, assistance in that just by, by shining a light on their stories. So I really do want to congratulate Beautiful Zanzi for the excellent work that you've been doing. And we look forward to you celebrating next week, Wednesday, at the gala dinner at in Pretoria and uh, uh, clinking many glasses uh, of, of Bubby on the future success of the publication. So thank you very much to Ivor and to my guests, Mervyn Abrams and Wandile Siklobo and Leona Archery this morning. Thank you for your time. And we will see you next week, Wednesday.
Okay.